I would like to introduce our uh, speaker uh, for the continuation in the series of lectures. Our presenter, Dr. Barry Wecker, was born in Saskatchewan, but has been practicing family medicine for the last 46 years, 35 of which were spent in New Brunswick. Dr. Wecker is a traveler, having visited 165 of the world's 196 countries. He lived cumulatively in Rwanda and Kenya, East Africa, and Côte d'Ivoire, West Africa, for seven years. Most he people who pursue a um, MPH degree have strong interest in prevention medicine and the public good. Dr. Wecker is one of those people. He is married with four children. Today we are grateful that he has chosen to be with us to share his vast knowledge base. Today's presentation is the fifth in the series of talks and is entitled Dementia and Alzheimer's Disease and the Two Operating Systems. We present to you Dr. Barry Wecker. So our talk tonight is going to be about, um, about a subject that I think affects, is interests most of us. Um, and as I was getting ready to just sort of go over the talk this morning, the news broke in New Brunswick. And um, so I decided to include a New Brunswick news report for you. It says, a new report suggests that the number of New Brunswickers living with dementia will double by the year 2050. The 60-page report entitled Navigating the Path Forward for Dementia in Canada, which was released by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, uses data from the Rising Tide Study of 2010. There are now 600,000 cases of dementia in Canada. The report states, by 2030, the number is going to reach 1 million, and by 2050, it's projected that the number will triple this year's figure and reach 1.7 million. So um, it is really quite a, an astonishing statistic and prediction. The report states that the reason for this rise in is the aging of the baby boomer generation, and it tries to inform Canadians about the importance of controlling the risk factors for dementia by quitting smoking, decreasing alcohol consumption, regular exercise, and the early treatment of depression. So that was the news that greeted me this morning. Um, the first case of Alzheimer's, as I told you, I told you a wrong date last night. I said 1901. It was 1906. And um, Dr. Alois Alzheimer described uh, the disease for the first time. He described a peculiar disease, and he linked the symptoms to microscopic brain changes. And he describes the haunting case of Auguste D., a patient who had profound memory loss, unfounded suspicions about her family, and other worsening psychological changes. The Alzheimer's Society describes the disease as a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills, and eventually the ability to carry out the most simple tasks. I have a colleague who, um, who is approaching 40 years of age. Her family have all developed early dementia starting in their early 40s. And it has always started with a numbness and tingling sensation in their feet, which I had never heard of before. And this colleague at age 40 has started with the numbness and tingling in her feet. She's terrified. 
with good reason. Um, I have another colleague who has been probably one of my best orthopedic surgeons in the area, the fellow who I generally referred to for knee surgeries and knee replacements. And um, not only has he been a good colleague, but his wife is um, a family, belongs to a family that's been very supportive of my projects overseas and they're very deep friends. And he recently retired unexpectedly. And I found out from one of his aunts that the reason he retired was because his memory is starting to slip and his ability to do his surgery is starting to slip at age 58. Here is probably one of the best orthopedic surgeons we have in our province. Well, no, I say one of the best. I wouldn't want to put down any of the others because we have a good collection of them. And he's losing his ability to do it because of the disease. A classmate of mine in high school um, went to dental school when I went to medical school. And um, when he graduated, he moved into my hometown. And I was doing my internship at the time. And um, I didn't like the elderly dentist that we'd had before. I thought he was a little bit rough, so I decided I was going to switch. And uh, so I started seeing Eugene. Come to find out, he went into practice with my former dentist, so <laughs> that was kind of difficult. But anyhow, Eugene was just a very good friend. He married one of my childhood friends, and uh, we have been friends for years. My sister worked for him as his office manager. And suddenly, he started losing the ability. He'd forget which tooth he was going to fill. Had to have staff with him to keep him focused on what he was doing. And then very quickly, discovered that he couldn't remember how to do the procedures. So he had to retire. The last time I saw him, we managed to hold a fairly good conversation together but he couldn't do the most simple tasks. If he went to the toilet, he didn't know what to do in the toilet. If he got on the lawnmower, he didn't know how to turn it on. And so the last comment I made to him as I was leaving, we were invited over for dinner, and um, I said, well, you're retired. Um, I said, I'm He said, don't be jealous. So, this disease is an incredibly devastating disease that just destroys the very essence of who a person is. Um, so, the various things that, um, and I'll start putting, a, moving a few slides here. So, we have um, just sort of an introduction, and I think this particular um, slide shows really what happens. You see this green summertime tree, and then you see the yellow as autumn starts, and it's losing its leaves, and then by the time you get to the red autumn tree, most of the leaves are falling off, and um, that's what happens. So this was my breaking news from this morning. Um, so what happens in Alzheimer's disease? We're not 100% sure. We thought we knew what was happening. We thought it was because there was the deposit of something that we called amyloid plaques in the brain. Over last year, some research has debunked that idea and stated that these amyloid plaques are not necessarily the cause of Alzheimer's disease. We do know that the, in, the, the, the brain starts losing volume. It loses connectivity. So one nerve cell is not connected to another nerve cell. And that's why we start losing brain functioning. So one of the first things that happens is we lose our 
cognitive and functional capacity. And the person develops difficulty in understanding, thinking, memory, communication. They lose their ability to make decisions, to accomplish simple tasks or follow a conversation. The person can become combative and confused, losing their memory of recent events and finally even of past events. Many times when this starts out, that people compensate for it. And um, you could meet someone with dementia and unless you knew them well or were living with them, you may not recognize it because they can fool you. So what I do for diagnosing dementia is I have a test, two tests that I can use. One is called a mini mental status exam and the other one is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And these are t tests where we ask some questions and they bring out the difficulties very, very quickly, okay? It's, it's quite amazing. And the questions are kind of simple and at times I apologize to people because they're rather basic, simple questions, but they are able to pick up defects in our cognitive, our thinking ability. Um, emotions and mood can be affected. Let me see here, I'll move on. Um, here's some, the, some more of the prevalence worldwide. So in 2008, we had 25 million people with Alzheimer's in the world. And by 2020, we're up to 41 million, so almost double between 2008 and 2020. And we're projected for 2050 to be up to 106 million. That's in the world. Um, so that just once again shows the prevalence. Okay, so here are the symptoms. So um, language problems, certainly orientation problems. Now, I just got a phone call the day before I left my office from a very distraught daughter from a 519 area code. So I believe that's London, um, Sarnia area. Her father had been in the day before with his wife and she, the wife has been very distraught about his memory and she wanted me to pull his driver's license. Well, the provinces have very specific rules about when the driver's license needs to get pulled and pulling a person's driver's license is doing like, like doing an amputation. It's serious business. We, <laughs> those of us who drive, we depend on that skill for so much of what we do, and I am given, assigned the authority by the province to pull people's driver's license, but it's not something I want to do without making sure that it's needed to be done. So the, the gentleman had been in a year ago, and we had done this mini mental status exam for him, and it scored out of 30, and he scored 25 which shows some loss of cognitive function. So the day before the daughter called, I had redone it again, and he had scored fairly well. He had scored 27 on it, and I really probably should have given him a 28 because he, when I asked him what the date was, he said it was the 7th of, 7th of September, and it turned out it was the 6th of September, but we all make those mistakes fairly easily. If I wasn't writing prescriptions every day, I'd forget what date it was too. Um, so he was doing well, and it certainly didn't qualify for pulling his driver's license, but the daughter was very animate, just very animate about it. And I told her what the parameters are provincially for doing that. And I said, if you're concerned about your father's driving, then you need to talk to him and see, see what happens with that. But we lose our ability to do simple tasks. This colleague, a classmate of mine and friend of mine, um, he lost the ability to just, he didn't know what things were for. I've had one other patient with that symptom she would come into the office and she would ask me all sorts of questions about my children. She remembered their names. She remembered where they were. She, you know, uh, I was just amazed. 
But her daughter says, I give her some towels to fold, and she just sits there and has no idea how to fold them. Um, she says, I give her a pen to write something, and she doesn't know what the pen is for. So there are some different, um, different symptoms that come with this. Now, the other thing that happens to me quite often is I get people come in very distraught in their 60s and 70s and say, oh, I think I'm getting dementia because I'm forgetting stuff. I, I forget phone numbers. I forget, uh, I forget people's names, people I know fairly well, and I see them, and I, I can't think their name. I'm, I'm getting dementia. <laughs> well, that may not be the case, okay, because sometimes the older we get, the less we pay attention to things, too. We tend to run on, 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 on habits and sort of what we remember, and so we don't um, always pay attention. So I always tell people who have memory issues, look, let's just start doing some specific awareness of what you want to remember. Try to do it. You're going grocery shopping. I take a list with me when I go grocery shopping, too, because frequently I have four or five other things to do on the way, and if I don't take the list, I might not remember what my wife sent me. And so I want my marriage to survive, so I take a list along. But um, what I will try to do is I will try to remember what was on that list and keep the list in my pocket. And as I'm getting ready to go to the checkout counter, I pull it up just to make sure that I haven't forgotten an item. Um, so um, there are, there are some, um, some things that are not necessarily signs of dementia. So 10 precursor signs, okay? And I, I sort of preface this by saying, are you worrying that you have some symptoms or is the health of someone close to you getting worrisome? So here are 10 worrisome signs. We have... Um, and I think I may go back on here. Um, memory lapses um, affecting um, our everyday life, frequently forgetting events, difficulties in remembering new information, difficulty in doing tasks, no longer remembers how to do the task or the task that they've done for years suddenly becomes very, very complicated and they have a hard time doing it. Language issues, forgetting words or using them inappropriately. Disorientation of time and place, don't know what day it is. And frequently, that, those are the first questions I ask on the, on the mental, many mental status exam is, what day is it? What day of the week is it? What year is it? What month is it? What season is it? And someone with dementia will frequently, I'll get, what year are we in? And they'll say, oh, that one's easy. I don't need to answer that one. No, no, seriously. What year is it? Well, you know what year it is. Yeah, well, yeah, I do know what year it is. What, do you know what year it is? Uh, and they try to hedge to, you know, to, to protect this memory glitch. And finally, when I push them, they'll say, 2006. I say, well, you're a little bit off with that. Really? I was just joking. And uh, so there's a lot of cover-up with it that goes on. Um, judgment glitches. Um, not recognizing a serious medical problem. Or heading out when it's minus 35 with a T-shirt on and a ball cap and forgetting what clothes they need to wear. Um, getting lost can't find your way back home. And that's one of the things that I will have to pull a driver's license for if people are driving and they get lost. Um, difficulty with abstract ideas. Don't understand the numbers on a calculator or um, can't use a telephone or uh, just can't figure out how to dial a number on a telephone. And we've had to actually make big sheets of paper for people with family members' names and telephone numbers or speed dial them so they're easy to dial. Um, inappropriate placing of objects. Um, you go looking and um, there are spoons and forks in the laundry drawer or um, there's all sorts of things that are not put in the right place. Changes of mood and behavior, wild variation in mood between calmness, agitation, and aggression. Changes in personality, they may become paranoid or feel threatened. 
and loss of initiative. They just get detached from family and friends. They're not interested in their normal hobbies. And they just seem lost. On Sunday last week, I was asked to do a funeral for a young man 33 years of age who um, unfortunately had had type 1 diabetes, had had renal failure, um, was on dialysis, waiting for a kidney transplant, had an appointment this week in Quebec for, for working up for a kidney transplant. And um, he just collapsed and passed away. His father has dementia. And so as we went through the line to greet and talk to the family, mother, brother, wife, and two children were standing there, but father was just lost. You could just tell. He, he, he was just lost. Now, I had been by the house to talk to him, and he knew what had happened, and he understood what had happened. But with all the people at the funeral, and it was a big funeral, just wasn't sure what he was to do. We had to direct him where he was to go and where he was to stand. And when you went to talk to him, he just wasn't there. Now, there are other types of dementia besides Alzheimer's disease. We have vascular dementia, where people get hardening of the arteries in the brain, and um, we don't get good blood flow to parts of the brain. So that's another type. We have um, a mixed dementia, which could be part Alzheimer's, part vascular. We have one called Lewy body's dementia. And with Lewy body's dementia, people frequently are hallucinating. They're seeing people who aren't there. They're looking outside, and they're seeing vehicles going by, or they're seeing people going by, and they're not there. So, and the treatment for that one is slightly different. Um, and then, we, of course, we have you know, the mad cow disease, crutzfeld jakob disease, which um, we're getting more and more people with, and it presents with a loss of brain function as well. And there have been times when we have wondered whether Alzheimer's was actually related to um, mad cow disease um, and caused by a prion, which is a very small infectious particle, but we've not been able to prove that. OK, so some statistics now. Um, with regards to, um, to age and gender, um, certainly the, the incidence of dementia rises as we get older. At age 65, we have 10% of the population with signs of dementia. At 75, we have 25%. And at 85, we have 50%. Now, I told you last night that I don't see this in Africa. Um, the only people I see that are feeble-minded are perhaps people who have had a history of alcoholism and just sort of um, damaged their brain because of alcohol. But usually the elders, the, the, the people that are in their 80s and 90s, are very, very bright with it people in Africa. They may be physically feeble, but they are not mentally feeble. Um, now, some of my colleagues will remind me that in Africa, people don't live as long. The life expectancy is not as long, so there are fewer people of those ages, and there is some truth to that. But I still think that there is some sort of an environmental component, which we're going to look at and talk about, that plays a role with this. When my parents first came to visit me when we were living in Rwanda, we were, they were introduced in the church that we went to as Umusaza and Umuketru, old man and old lady. Well, my parents were in their 60s at the time, and I was insulted to think that they were called old man and old lady. And then I realized that that was a major, major cultural dissonance. <laughs> because here in Canada, it's almost insulting to be called old. <laughs> 
but not in Africa. It is one of the highest honors that you can give. And so these terms were actually the most honorific titles that you could possibly use. And uh, the same thing in Congo, you know, Tate is anti, and it's uh, a name that's given to people who are, are elderly. And um, so, yeah, I had to confront some cultural differences when that took place. But old age is valued in, um, in Africa. As I told you, in India, we see 10% of the number of cases of dementia that we have here. And I think part of that is a, is a diet a dietary change in a diet that's rich in antioxidants and rich in um, anti-inflammatories. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the eighth most common cause of death here in Canada. Um, there seems to be a genetic predisposition. I told you about the colleague whose whole family gets premature dementia. The genes for dementia seem to be more important if people get it younger. So when people start getting dementia in their 40s and 50s, there is very often a genetic predisposition to it. Whereas when people begin getting dementia in their 70s and 80s, um, we don't see the genetic component to that quite as much. Um, but as I told you about epigenetics, just because we do have a gene for dementia, does not mean that we necessarily have to have it. There are environment. come on on in, don't hesitate, just come on on in if you want. <laughs> um, there are things we can do to prevent the expression of a gene um, and things that we can do that enhance the expression of a gene. As far as treatment is concerned, I don't have a treatment. And I know some of the neurologists and the gerontologists prescribe a type of medication that we call cholinesterase inhibitors. We have three of them that are available here in Canada. One is called donepazil, galantamine, and then there's rivastigmine. Um, I frequently will prescribe those because families are insistent that they receive it. Um, the gerontologists prescribe them. I have never yet ever seen a positive benefit from prescribing them. I've never seen any reversal. The gerontologists who I work with tell me that what it does is it slows down the progression of disease. Um, I don't have any good way of evaluating that because everyone's progression is at a different rate and I don't know that anyone else has a capacity to predict that as well. So we really don't have any treatment for it. Um, the disease bothers the entire family because it becomes a real difficult family issue. Family members will go out at night, they get lost, they don't know how to get back in. Especially, I um, don't know if you remember the Quebec politician whose mother was in a... Uh, a senior's home, and there was a fire drill one night, and she um, went out with the fire drill, and she couldn't get back in, and it was in the middle of the winter, and she froze to death outside the home. I don't know whether it was um, Bouchard's mother or um, one of the Quebec politicians' mothers. Um, so we have to be careful. Most places that deal with Alzheimer's patients, you have to punch a code in to get out the door so it prevents people from leaving without supervision. Um, so the biggest thing that we want to look at is prevention. What can we do to prevent dementia? The sad part about prevention is, is that we need to be starting this at age 15 rather than at age 65 because it's a lifetime of, of, of habits that seem to be causative or that enhance dementia. So some of the things that we do are, um, so let me just go through these slides here. So these are, the, these are the treatments, the cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, there's another one called um, Namzaric, which I have never used. 
and Namenda, which is a combination of a cholinase, cholinesterase inhibitor. And then we've got some future treatment with monoclonal antibodies that are under investigation. But right now, we really don't have a good treatment. So prevention. We need to clean up all the cobwebs. Um, so I put together a list or a collection of several slides here of things that are promoted as a prevention for dementia. The first one is exercise. The more we exercise and the, mo the more we get vigorous exercise, the less likely we are to develop dementia. So exercise opens up the arteries, keeps the, um, keeps the oxygen going to the brain, and so a habit pattern of exercise is important. I always tell people that sitting is one of the worst activities that we can do. And we can tell a person's longevity or how long they're going to live or how much time in the day we spend sitting. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm meddling, aren't I? Um, uh, frequently I see people who are retiring and, you know, and I'll say, well, what are you going to do with your retirement? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I said, sit in front of the television and wait for the funeral home to call, or um, what do you want to do? <laughs> um, but the more we sit, the worse it is. Um, diet plays a very big role, I feel. So they are recommending with these, um, and this particular slide here, and I'll go through some of these slides, is a plant-based foods consume a 15 milligrams of vitamin E every day, get 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise each week. I, I think that's, I'll have to look at my slide here to see how many minutes that is. 120 minutes per week is what it says. 120 minutes. Um, cut back on saturated fats and trans fats, which block our circulation. Um, choose vitamins that don't have iron or copper in them. And that's a whole other area that I haven't included in my talks this week, but I'm just learning a lot about and how when our magnesium levels go down, our iron levels go up and our copper levels go up. And those are factors that play a role. Um, maybe next year I'll have some info on that. Choose aluminum-free products. We talked about deodorants and Tums and Rolids. Just avoid things that have aluminum in them. And um, have some B12. Um, make sure our B12 levels are OK. So that's one of the slides. Another one here says, one in three cases of dementia could be prevented by addressing these lifestyle factors. Well, one in three, if you look at you know, a million cases in Canada within the next eight years, one in three is going to be 300,000 people. If, so that would be no little um, benefit. So the things are increase, whoops, increase physical activity, increase our social contacts, um, decrease our hearing loss. So if we do lose hearing, we get hearing aids because the loss of hearing does isolate us socially, and then that seems to play a factor. Um, obesity, smoking, treat depression early, and of course, prevent diabetes, manage diabetes, try to cure diabetes. Um, diabetes is a major, major factor with dementia, and we'll look at that in just a couple of minutes. So what about diet? <clears throat> Balanced diet, rich in phytonutrients. These are all these colored plant products the 40 different um, plant-based foods that we include in a week of different colors. Um, low in carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are your starches and sugars. So we should be burning healthy fats instead of sugars. Um, a diet rich in healthy fats decreases the incidence of dementia by 44%, whereas a diet high in carbohydrates causes an 85% increase in dementia. So that's a statistic that I think is worth noting. So if you have good healthy fats in your diet, 44% um, decrease, whereas an 85% increase if you have a diet high in carbohydrates. 
So frequently when I'm doing food surveys with patients, I'll say, well, what did you eat for breakfast? Well, I had a bowl of Cheerios with, and what'd you put on it? Some honey, um, banana. Okay, carbohydrate, carbohydrate, carbohydrate. Well, what else did you have? Well, I had some toast, carbohydrate. Um, what did you put on the toast? Well, I put some jam on the toast, carbohydrate. Uh, anything else? Uh, <laughs> we live on diets of carbohydrates, okay? All of us do, you know? It's hard to avoid. So um, we need to work at changing somewhat our diet, increasing the amount of vegetables and fruits, and um, decreasing the amount of starches and sugars. Um, it says it's better for a body to burn healthy fats than carbohydrate as, fu as fuel. A diet rich in vegetables, poor in grains, rich in healthy fats, poor in carbohydrates is the best diet to keep the brain healthy. Um, the use of sugar is a causative factor in the development of dementia. That's why we're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. And, um, and people who have chronically high blood sugars have a tendency to develop late onset Alzheimer's disease. In a longitudinal study published in the journal Diabetologia, in a diabetic journal in 2018, followed 5,189 people in the UK over a course of 10 years. And they found that those with an elevated blood sugar due to type 1, type 2 diabetes were more likely than those with normal blood sugars to develop dementia. The study's authors wrote that memory executive function and orientation scores showed an increased rate of cognitive decline with diabetes. Now, of course, diabetes is epidemic in our country right now. It is epidemic in our elementary schools, our secondary schools. So we need to see what we can do to control our blood sugars. Um, if any of you are diabetic, and I would guess that there are probably at least four or five in the room, um, the new little discs that um, you can put on your arm to monitor your blood sugar is called a Freestyle Libra. Is an amazing little invention we've had for the past two or three years. And um, I am not a diabetic, but I wore one as sort of a demonstration when they first started coming out, the drug rep let me put one on. And I'll tell you, I learned more information about my blood sugar from that um, little disc that was on my arm than you can imagine. For example, um, it was October and the pharmacy next door had little packages of potato chips there, you know, the ones you give out for Halloween, you know, and everything. And they were there for all, anyone to have them. And I was hungry one day and I picked up a couple of packages of them and quickly woofed them down and checked my blood sugar. You know, you just have, you take your phone and you just um, go beep, and then it tells you what your blood sugar is. So um, those two little packages, tiny little Halloween packages of potato chips, put my, spike my blood, blood sugar up. Wow, shock. I didn't think potato chips would do it. Uh, another day, it was a weekend, a Sunday, and I was in Fredericton, and at the exhibition grounds, they had an international food fair. And they had, oh, booths that were selling food from all the countries around the world, and it was fantastic. And of course, I imbibed in the Lebanese counter that was there and had a bunch of Lebanese food. And um, checked my sugar, and didn't go up too much, didn't go up too much. And so I had to take someone home to the, the cross town, and as I was coming back, I saw a Dairy Queen. I said, okay, Dairy Queen, let me check that one out, okay? So I went in, had a Dairy Queen, and uh, didn't bump my sugar up at all. The reason was I had just had a full meal. So if you have your dessert at the end of a full meal, the meal stabilizes your sugar out. I didn't know that. I thought for sure it would have bumped it up, okay? So, <laughs> so another little in interesting thing that I learned was I come home and there were some bananas on the table, so I ate two bananas. Boy, my sugar just popped up real fast. But if I had my meal, and then ate my two bananas, it didn't do it, okay? So um, I learned a lot from this. Um, my project director from Congo was with me in May, and um, he's overweight, and um, I've been concerned about his health for some time, not only because I don't know what I'd do without him, but, uh, you know, I am concerned about him, too. 
So I um, decided I was going to start monitoring his blood sugars because he had tested them a few times. And he was getting blood sugars of 20. So I, if you, those of you who know blood sugars, the normal goes between 3.5 and about 5.5, 5.7. So 20 was quite high. So I bought one of these Freestyle Libra discs and I stuck it on his arm. And um, just by doing that, he changed his eating habits so much that his sugar stabilized just by knowing what it was and what foods did to it. So if any of you do have troubles with blood sugars or are interested in finding out, get one of these things. You don't need a prescription to buy them in Canada. You can get them at any pharmacy. If you have an iPhone, you just download the app on your iPhone. Now Androids, newer model Androids will do the same. You can download it. You don't need to buy a monitor. And you just put it on your skin. You wear it for two weeks. You can bathe with it, shower with it, whatever you want. And um, you can check your sugar as many times a day as you want. Okay? So you just beep and look at what your sugar is. You can see the graph. You can see how it's how it was up or down, and if you are diabetic, then you get the Freestyle Libra 2, which has um, an alarm system in it, so you can set the values that you want to get an alarm for. If it goes too low or too high, it'll wake you up in the middle of the night, it'll vibrate, it'll ring, and you can, you know, when your sugars get out of your range. So it's very helpful. Controlling sugars is very important for um, diabetes or dementia prevention. People with type 2 diabetes have four times higher risk of developing dementia than those who do not. Even people with what we call an elevated fasting blood sugar, so they're pre-diabetic, still have an increased um, incidence of developing um, dementia. And I told you the other day that the brain cells are the only cells that do not require insulin to get blood sugar in. Blood sugar goes across easily. And therefore, high sugars are toxic to brain cells, and that's what we feel is the cause of this increased risk of dementia. Okay, let's see if I got another one here. Six ways to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Exercise daily. Eat Mediterranean, a diet rich in produce, legumes, fish. Reduces inflammation of the body and the brain. Kick bad habits. If you smoke, quit. If you drink more than two drinks a day, cut back to one or fewer or stop. Take your meds, manage conditions like high cholesterol or blood pressure. They can protect your heart and brain. Engage your brain, not just with puzzles, but try to learn a new skill. And that is something that I think is very important. Most of us quit learning when we graduate from high school or college. We don't learn much anymore. We see the same people, we eat the same food, we go to the same places. We don't learn a lot. Um, and so no wonder our brains fall apart. So we need to learn some things, you know, learn a a new skill, a new art form, you know, learn how to do a new um, type of work, um, woodworking, quilting, knitting, um, learn a new language, um, whatever. Challenge your brain and use it. We had a group of nuns in the United States who donated their, their brains to science. These ladies were all in their 80s and 90s. They were very actively involved with missions. They were praying for the people in these missions. They were working with them. They were very busy and very active. And none of them showed signs of dementia. When they died, the autopsies in their brains showed that they had severe changes that go, went along with dementia. And yet none of them in their, in their mental functioning had the disease. And it was largely because they had kept their brains active and it kept them functioning. So an active mind is very, very important with this as well. Um, one thing that we're finding is, um, and one thing that's a big concern for me, and you're going to get tired of me saying it, but it's Roundup, glyphosate. Glyphosate is an antibiotic. Glyphosate destroys our bioflora in the gut. It, um, it also breaks down the blood-brain barrier. And normally, there is a barrier between the blood and the brain. And this was first discovered 
back in the 1800s, about 1885, there was a researcher who injected blue dye into rats. And this blue dye colored all the tissues in the rat's body except the brains. So that was interesting. So then he injected the blue dye into the brains of the rats and it colored the brains, but it didn't color any other parts of the body. So they realized that there was some sort of a barrier between the bloodstream and the brain. And it was in the 1960s when we had better microscopes, electron microscopes, we were able to see that the cells in the blood vessels in the brain are so tightly knit together that very few things get across that barrier. And um, very small molecules will get across. Alcohol gets across. That's why people use it for the brain-altering effects. Um, there are certain other chemicals that will get across. But there are things that break this blood-brain barrier down. And toxins are one of them. And glyphosate, Roundup, is one of them too. Now, the other thing is pharmaceutical companies want to break the blood-brain barrier down because they want their medications to get into the brain. So they are engineering ways with medications to punch holes in the blood-brain barrier. Very distraught about this. And we need to be aware um, of these types of medications and what they can do at punching these holes in the brain. When the holes get in there, then all sorts of things can go through this blood-brain barrier. And we are thinking that these amyloid plaques that get in there pass through the holes in the blood-brain barrier. You know, God has created us with, you know, a protection system for our brain. And here we are trying to break it down um, for a variety of reasons. So... With the glyphosate, the first GMO food that was developed was 1994, and it was called a flavor saver tomato. Since 1994, there's been an exponential increase in GMO foods, and most GMO foods are sprayed with Roundup. Since 1975, we have put 9 billion kilograms of glyphosate on the face of this earth. So much so that we now have glyphosate in our rain. The agricultural people will state, oh, it doesn't last around very long, but that's not true. Another news article that I read today was that a professor at the University of New Brunswick has been under intense pressure by the forestry industry in New Brunswick to kick him out of the university because he's against glyphosate. <laughs> he's lectured to his students in the forestry department about the dangers of glyphosate. That's almost like speaking against Vladimir Putin, you know, you might know, may never know what will happen to you. Um, Glyphosate is powerful in the agricultural industry. It's powerful in the forestry industry. And it's all about money. It's all about making bigger and bigger profits from these things. But it's a powerful toxin. So, like I said, it's an antibiotic. It destroys our intestinal biome. It punches holes in our intestinal tracts. It causes leaky gut syndrome. And both that leads to inflammation and we know that dementia is caused by inflammation. And now the latest studies coming out are that glyphosate destroys our body's manganese, which is another trace mineral. And this manganese is very important for brain health. So I looked today, because this news is just coming out, and I wonder whether I put it in here. OK, I'm, I'm behind on some of my slides. Um, type 3 diabetes. Um, diabetes causes various different levels of, of disease. Type 3 prevention. Kill the sugar before it kills you. Sugar is the source of all chronic disease. Okay, the food we eat modifies our DNA. Um, 
I think I put something in here about manganese, but I'll go through it and I may come to it in a bit. So the foods that are rich in manganese are nuts, such as almonds and pecans, beans and legumes, lima beans, pinto beans, oats and bran are, have ma manganese in them, whole wheat bread has manganese, brown rice, leaf leafy green vegetables such as spinach, fruits such as pineapple and acai, and then one that you're all going to appreciate, dark chocolate. <laughs> So these all have manganese in them. Um, I'll try to catch up on some of my slides here with, uh, so I can not be out of step. Um, changes in diet and physical exercise, first steps in prevention of dementia. Takes 20 years of good habits to prevent dementia. So we need to start teaching our children habits while they're young. Get them involved in the kitchen, teach them the principles of healthy eating. Don't ax PE classes in school. Get them involved with sports. And the sports of most kids should be more than this one, thumb sports, okay? Um, avoid all toxins as much as possible. Heavy metals, MSG, artificial sweeteners, petroleum products, cigarette smoke, vehicle exhaust, glyphosate, pesticides, insecticides, herbicides. Um, we need to avoid all those toxins. Um, and there's the culprit right there. Um, and these are the diseases that I found that are now getting research that are caused by glyphosate. Hypertension, stroke, diabetes, obesity, lipoprotein metabolism disorder. That's a type of cholesterol disorder. Um, Alzheimer's dementia, other dementias, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism, inflammatory bowel disease, infections, and cancers. Now, Monsanto has sold glyphosate to Bayer, German company, and Bayer is paying out millions of dollars. In fact, the worst lawsuit they got was from a fellow in California who sued them for one point something billion dollars. So they are, they're facing a fair amount of legal suits, but they're only going to increase. The problem is, once again, the support of agriculture in, um, in the use of glyphosate. So here are your top foods in manganese um, from this slide tea powder, turmeric, black pepper, hazelnuts, ginger, cinnamon. See, some of these are the anti-inflammatories I told you about before. Pine nuts, oregano, cardamom, wheat germ, hemp seeds, hemp heart seeds, and oats. <clears throat> um, another area that is involved with some of this are the statins. Very difficult to see a physician these days and not get prescribed a statin. They're just, everybody that goes to the emergency department comes home with a statin for their cholesterol and a stomach um, acid inhibitor. Um, but both of these pills are not terribly good. Avoid tobacco in all its farms. Okay, so for an optimal brain health, a healthy balanced diet, regular aerobic exercise, don't smoke, avoid all toxins, Detox if you've been exposed to them. Manage stress. Use your brain. Keep learning. Quality sleep eight hours a night. Treat sleep apnea. Um, so those are some of the suggestions. Um, good social relationships. Good spiritual relationships. Relaxation. Positive thoughts. Genetics are the gun, but toxins and foods pull the trigger. Now, before I go on to there, there's one other section that I wanted to go over with you. And this is, if you're interested in detoxing from toxins, um, and I think that with the amount of toxins that we have in our environment, periodically doing a detox might be worthwhile. And the detox foods are largely the cruciferous vegetables. So I made a list of them, broccoli, collards, lettuce, cress, radishes, Chinese radish, arugula, or in French it's roquette, cabbage, kale, red cabbage, mustard, sauerkraut, horseradish, rutabaga, Brussels sprouts, curly kale, cauliflower, turnips, kohlrabi, black radish, rapini. All of these cruciferous vegetables are very, very helpful in doing a detox. And um, there are several detox programs that are available online. Um, 
We've talked about the blood-brain barrier. We've talked about inflammation, the role that tobacco plays. Um, glyphosate, the gut-brain connection. Um, a couple of other studies here which I found quite interesting on the glyphosate issue. Um, <clears throat> it says antibiotics function by killing off bacteria. If you're suffering from a bacterial infection, the right antibiotic could be life-saving, but we're exposed to too many antibiotics now. In addition to potentially leading antibiotic resistance, antibiotic exposure such as in the form of glyphosate in our food kills off the healthy bacteria that live in our gut. Um, <clears throat> in order to understand how glyphosate may impact our brain health, um, we have to understand our gut health, which we talked about um, the other night. These neurotransmitters that are affected, they're involved with cellular communication, um, and they play a very big role in the innate immune system, which also affects Alzheimer's. Um, but that's not the study that I wanted here. Um, <clears throat> in 2018, the Environmental Working Group conducted their second set of tests on popular oat-based cereals to determine its glyphosate content. In all 28 samples from various oat-based products, such as General Mills, Quaker, glyphosate was detected in the oats. 26 of the 28 samples had glyphosate levels above what the currently accepted safety levels are, 160 parts per billion. These results came just two months after the um, Environmental Working Group tested 45 products with conventionally grown oats and found that 43 of them had glyphosate in them too because it's in the rain. Um, it should be noted that glyphosate was also detected in organic oat products tested, but it was significantly less. Um, <clears throat> another study by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment um, added glyphosate to the list of chemicals in the state of California known to cause cancer despite an unsuccessful appeal against Monsanto. And this lawsuit that was had for 1.3 billion, I think, was in California. Just knowing that glyphosate is known to cause cancer should be reason enough to make you want to avoid it at all costs. But also, if glyphosate is known to cause cancer, what other correlations with chronic diseases have we not only established yet? Only time will tell. So um, that's my rant on glyphosate. <clears throat> How do we avoid it? We avoid it by buying organic as best as we can. We avoid it by growing our own food as much as possible. Um, and we need to um, state our perspective with our wallet and vote with our wallet and not buy some of these GMO foods. Um, Another study from the Journal of Organic Systems coming from 2014 showed a huge increase in glyphosate in the United States. This is an American study. It disrupts the endocrine system, gets the gut bacteria out of balance, damages the DNA, driver of mutations that lead to cancer. In the present study, U.S. government databases were searched for um, G crop data glyphosate application data and disease data. Diseases which seem to have a significant correlation with glyphosate include all the ones that I had up there, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, obesity, etc. So um, <clears throat> these toxins are a, a major thing. So in summary, um, what do we do about preventing dementia? We start with our children. We start with our young people, our grandchildren, and we try to get them going with healthy lifestyles. For ourselves, a well-balanced, organic, plant-based diet, regular exercise, no tobacco or vaping. And vaping now, you know, a lot of the kids are going into vaping. It's so full of chemicals. It may not have all the tars that nicotine does, but it's full of hundreds of other chemicals, and they are all toxins. Avoid toxins, detox if you're exposed, regular quality sleep, treat sleep apnea, control stress, use your brain, good social connections, 
good spiritual connections, relaxation, positive thinking. Depression doubles the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease in women and multiplies it by four for men. Appreciation, gratitude, and love are positive thoughts. Anger, fear, and guilt are negative ones. Any questions about, um, about dementia? <clears throat> I'm sure we all know people who have it. And um, tragic, tragic disease. Yeah. Uh, sorry. You mentioned in terms of prevention, uh, sitting is not great. Right, in, in terms of, uh, now I, I'm someone who exercises each day regularly, but I spend a lot of time sitting. So does my sitting negate my exercise or my exercise negate my sitting? Sitting negates your exercise. Mm. Um, <laughs> we are, it, it, it's a significant enough problem that many workplaces now are is putting in alternative workstations so um, Google has in their office, you have an option, you can get a treadmill, you know, and you put your computer up and you can walk while you're doing your, some of your working. There's other ones that have um, pedals that you can pedal while you're doing so you can keep some level of mobility going while you're, while you're working. We all have sitting that's involved with our jobs to some degree, especially with COVID and working at home and on a computer. Um, I don't think we're going to avoid sitting completely. Truck drivers are terribly at risk for this. They're sitting all the time for their, for their driving. And usually their eating habits are pretty dreadful as well. Um, yeah, we need to just look at what the other alternatives are. With my knee degeneration, um, I can work all day long and do fine, but I get home and sit down for a few minutes, and boy, do I feel those knees when I get up. It's like, I feel like the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. I need an oil can to go with me. Um, I can play tennis, and it, they don't bother it too much, or play pickleball, but boy, sitting will do my knees in terribly. Um, yeah, we just need to evaluate that. We sit too much. So maybe we should get everybody before we start into part two to stand up and just stretch for a few seconds, okay? <laughs> yeah, so feel free to just stand up and then we'll launch into our, our part two here. <clears throat> I think if we do sit a fair amount, that what we should do is break it up. And um, t you know, every 10, 15 minutes, we do something other than, other than sitting, OK? And um, stretch those joints and just um, get a big, deep breath. And that helps our brain oxygenate. And it just does, does us wonders. Good. So this evening for part two, um, it's going to be fairly straightforward. Um, what I've done is I've called it the two operating systems. And um, yeah, sure, go right ahead. For the people who have or have noticed dementia, dementia in their homes, right? Mm -hmm. Say their partner or sure, their or parent, parent or whatever. Somebody, yes. And um, when, when you see things that, are, that you notice very clearly, they're forgetting or whatever, and sometimes some of the things are a little funny, do you make light of it or how do you address it? Okay, that's a very, very good question. Um, I think that varies with the stage of the dementia. When the person is starting into a dementia, it's helpful to just be helpful to them. Make, make signs up, you know, with reminders, give them whatever they need to help facilitate their memory. Um, I don't argue with people with dementia, though. It, it, it does no good at all. If they're convinced that you are a stranger and not a mate or something, don't argue with them because it's only going to make them angry. So I had one man who came in and his wife would get furious when he would walk into the house. Who are you? Who are you? 
Well, I'm your husband. No, you're not. My husband will be so upset with you if he finds you here in this house, you know. Well, where are you going to stay tonight? You're not staying in this house. Well, yes. Well, where are you going to stay? Right there in that bedroom. Well, that's my bedroom, and you can't stay with that. My husband will be angry with you. And, oh, terrible. And I had another patient who would just get so angry with his wife at home. He would just be furious. He would go outside in the middle of the winter. I will not stay in my house with you. You are a strange person. It might, you are not my wife. Yet he'd come into my office with his wife, and I'd say, Bill, who is that sitting next to you? Well, that's Jenny. Yes. And who is Jenny? Well, she's my wife. So he'd know it in my office, but the home was a chaotic mess because of it, and we had to take him out of the home because the wife just couldn't even stay there. So there are times when you have to laugh. There are times when you can't help but laughing. It, it, there are some pretty comical situations you get into. The other part to this is when you have a spouse, you're young, you know, they're in their 50s, and there has been a, a history of dementia in the, in the family, family, like a mother and so on. But they don't want to think that they have the, this issue. How do you... Meet that all the time. You know, Meet how do you... And, and, and the, 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 the partner gets so frustrated and sometimes, like, try their best or... So they're not supposed to mention anything or no, what? No, yeah, I, I think that you have to be straightforward and honest about it. Um, but without pushing or without, you know, once again, sometimes you can't convince people. Yes. Logic doesn't work, yes. you know, so you can sit and talk logically all you want, but it's just not going to work. So it, it's a difficult thing to judge, but I think initially you try to help with reminders, you try to facilitate, you try to be supportive, you try to fill in the gaps. But when it comes to the difficult moments, sometimes you just have to sit back and laugh. And other times, it's serious enough that you have to take the person out of the home. Yeah, it just doesn't work. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, at the beginning of COVID, when we started, I work in accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning of COVID, when we started to work from home, oh. we also had a new operating system that we had to work with. And that was one of the most difficult things that I've ever done. Because the steps, it, it was like from working in the office where I had my files, et cetera, et cetera. Where you I, knew where everything was. Yeah. It was familiar. Then you're working from home and you've got a totally new operating system to learn and that is Alzheimer's prevention. <laughs> <laughs> it nearly killed me. Yes, but it's important for you to learn. <laughs> so, so when I get a very difficult patient in with some uh, mysterious complaint, I always look at them and say, well, I have no idea what that was, but I'll tell you what, you're preventing Alzheimer's disease in me because I got to think about this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the challenges of learning new things is not easy, you know, and especially when it's a new operating system or something. But no, those are the things we need to be doing, especially as we get older. So um, just chalk that up to prevention, okay? <laughs> and stuff because, sorry, I found, I found that I was even forgetting stuff because it just seemed to be so much. Because it overloaded you, yes. And an overloaded mind will cause a little bit of forgetting. But um, once again, we, you know, that's not necessarily a sign of dementia. It's a sign of being overloaded. Yeah, too many things, too many things on the go. So, uh, yeah, another question here? It's kind of actually piggybacking off of what he said. Um, my question is how or what's an identifier, or if there is any, um, when, you know, you might have a different case, a different uh, issue that causes memory loss. Um, and as you get older, it might continue to progress and get worse as you get older, as your body deteriorates. Um, how do you know 
the bigger differences. So for instance, like say you have inattentive ADHD or hypothyroidism, something that does sometimes cause memory loss sure. on a you know regular basis. You know, if it continues to kind of get worse as you get older, how do you know that? How would how a, you know a family dementia. member? Yeah, how would a family so member know? Yeah. Related to the diagnosis. So what we do with when a person comes in with memory issues, there are several things that I do right away. Okay, before it gets too advanced, I want to evaluate their thyroid and make sure there's no no thyroid issues going on. I do want to, uh, I check all their blood work, make sure I'm not missing something else with blood work, especially look at vitamin B12 levels, look at folic acid levels. Um, I encourage them to supplement vitamin D. I encourage them to supplement omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I will um, look for other sorts of problems. If you have a person who has a family history of Huntington's chorea, for example, Huntington's disease, that's another one that, very devastating disease. And I thought about that when you were mentioning the family doesn't, or the person doesn't want to be checked, because I do have a family with a history of Huntington's, and the two children will not go to be tested. They watch their father die of it, they watch their sister die of it, and they just don't even want to know whether they have the risk, okay? So they won't go. Um, but we do screen for other causes. If there's hallucinations involved, then I think it's Lewy body's dementia. I do an MRI of the brain to make sure I'm not missing a tumor. I just had a lady, uh, an 87-year-old lady, who um, came into town one day with her shopping list and couldn't find the things in the store. And um, then she went to write out a check, and she couldn't remember how to write out the check. And she was embarrassed about it because she knows how to write out checks for a long, long time. And um, a family or a friend down the road, because children lived away, had a daughter here in Ottawa and a son in Calgary, and um, a friend down the road called me and let me know that this had happened. So I made a house call to see her. We talked about it. She says, yeah, I don't know what happened. I, I just got there and I didn't know how to write out the check. It was embarrassing. So um, the family were concerned as to whether we were dealing with dementia or not, but we found out that she had a urinary tract infection. So there's a difference between dementia and delirium. Delirium is a short-term, rapidly correctable form of confusion. Dementia is not. So we thought maybe this is delirium from a urinary tract infection. I treated that, and two days later, the son called me and said, there's something wrong with mom. She went into the bathroom. She was sitting on the toilet with all her clothes on, and she was going to the bathroom with all her clothes on. So another house call visit. I sat down to talk with her. We thought maybe loneliness was a factor with this, but that was obviously more than loneliness. I said, we need brain imaging. Brain imaging, massive brain tumor. Funeral was on Saturday afternoon. Okay. So uh, she opted for no treatment for it. So that was a, you know, one that confused us initially. You know, thoughts, first thought would go to dementia, the second thought went to delirium, urinary tract infection, and then finally, over two weeks, we said, no, th there's something wrong. Big brain tumor, yeah. So you gotta investigate all that, so an MRI and, yeah. Okay. So our, um, our second part here uh, about the two operating systems, we've been talking about the fear-based system, the love-based system. We've been talking about how one is focused on the prefrontal cortex and one is focused and uh, controlled by the amygdala. I'm going to take, and I, I've just put a table together for this, and I want to look at it from a spiritual perspective. Um, and I want to contrast these two different um, operating systems. The Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the powers of this earth. We see um, this, this, you know, this comparison. The parable that I told you about last night where Jesus looked at the people and said, you know, you were the ones that served me and provided for me. You were the ones that didn't, separating sheep from goats. So what I did is I just put together um, sort of a table, and I want to go through that with you. Um, and compare how spiritually the two operating systems um, compare. 
and then the battle of, for control between the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. So here's my table. Um, so if we have prefrontal cortex control, our life is based on other-centered love. Not self-love, but other-centered love. Whereas when it's controlled by the amygdala and the fear one, it's a life based on selfishness or self-centered love. And it's because we're afraid and we've got to protect ourselves. We've got to take care of ourselves because nobody else is going to take care of us. If our life is, if our brain is controlled or our mind is controlled by the prefrontal cortex, we live a life of service for others. But if it's controlled by the amygdala, we start accumulating more and more for ourselves. And we're interested in having more, getting more, doing more. And many times that leads to stepping on people to having more. Uh, um, the prefrontal cortex, we're concerned about the well-being of others, whereas the amygdala, it's self-protection based on fear. If we're controlled by the prefrontal cortex, we trust in God to provide and to take care of us. If we're controlled by the amygdala, we depend on ourselves, we do it ourselves. Um... Peace on the side of the prefrontal cortex, worry on the side of the amygdala. Spirituality on the side of the prefrontal cortex. Genuine interest in caring for others, a relationship with God and with each other, whereas religion where we follow all the rules and the regulations and we dress with the right dress and we eat the right foods and we say the right words and we pay the right money, and you know, you know the whole system. Um, <clears throat> on the side of the prefrontal cortex, a life of dependence on the creator, the source of life. On the side of control by the amygdala, a life of self-dependence. The side of the prefrontal cortex, freedom. The amygdala, control. Prefrontal cortex, generosity. Um, controlled by the amygdala, accumulation for oneself. That's similar to the top one there. Um, and I haven't finished some of these. I, I didn't finish the slide. I'm sorry about that. Um, on the side of the prefrontal cortex, the perspective of God being a physician who provides healing for our, for our fatal disease of fear. On the side of the amygdala, we perceive God as a judge who is going to give out punishment. On the side of the prefrontal cortex, we understand sin to be a fatal disease that needs to be cured. On the side of the amygdala, sin is a legal problem which needs to be punished. Um, on the side of the prefrontal cortex, the plan of salvation is a remedy for a fatal disease. Where on the side of the amygdala, the plan of salvation is a means to escape a legal penalty. On the side of the prefrontal cortex, the result of sin is death. On the side of the amygdala, the result of sin is punishment or torture. On the side of the prefrontal cortex, the judgment, it's God who's being judged for his character. On the side of the amygdala, it's I who's being judged for my sinfulness. On the side of the prefrontal cortex, the atonement is a restored relationship with God. On the side of the amygdala, the atonement is an erasure in a book of a record. Um, on the side of the prefrontal cortex, access to God is available to all. On the side of the amygdala, access to God is via a priest or Mary or a pastor or an imam or somebody. If we are controlled by our prefrontal cortex, the goal is healing and to be cured. Whereas if we're controlled by our amygdala, the goal is forgiveness. 
If we're controlled by our prefrontal cortex, grace brings a trusting, intimate friendship with our God. If we're controlled by the amygdala, obedience brings a conditional acceptance. On the side of the prefrontal cortex, the perspective that God is pained by our suffering and pain, caused by our ignoring his design laws, and he longs to make us well and makes us right again. On the side of the amygdala, the perspective that God is angry because of our disobedience and his justice requires that we pay dearly for our misbehavior. On the side of the prefrontal cortex, we have walked away from God. On the side of the amygdala, God has walked away from us. And I will, cor I will fill in the rest of these. I, I didn't realize I hadn't finished filling it in. And I'll give you a copy of this so that you don't have to write them all down, okay? But you see how these, how the, the, the focus, the locus of control in our brain changes our whole perception of things. It changes our perception of life. And it changes our perception of God. And instead of being comfortable with the idea of meeting God someday face to face, we see him standing in front of a judgment bar with a punishment area there and we're afraid changes everything depending whether we are controlled by our prefrontal cortex, whether we understand that love is the basis of the entire universe rather than fear. And, um, <clears throat> and some of these are just, the, the difference doesn't seem like much, but it's definitely there and it changes our lives and influences our lives. And so, we all have a choice as to which operating system we're going to use. We can choose to operate out of fear, control, and we will then try to control others the same way. Because you see, there's a law that we become like the being that we admire and worship. And so if we are admiring and looking at a fearsome, horrible God, then we will become fearsome and horrible ourselves. And we'll be out trying to force everybody to do whatever we think they ought to do. And unfortunately, as I mentioned last night, religious people can be that way quite often. But God's never that way. He stands with his arms open and invites us, but never forces himself on us. He invites us to come to him. He can and will heal all the damage done if we'll just let him. Our subject on Thursday night, we're not going to have a meeting tomorrow night. Our subject on Thursday will be... Um, on uh, ADHD and autism. Um, some interesting information on that. And then I'm going to follow through a little bit on this two operating systems for the second part. And the title is going to be, There is no need to be afraid of God. And um, we're just going to look at some really, th some incredible things that Jesus taught and that God has tried to reveal to us that we don't need to be afraid of him. So um, that's what we'll do on Thursday night. I wish you all a very good night and a very good day tomorrow. And um, just do some thinking about um, what we can do to change some habits in our lives so that we can be healthier. We can't change things tremendously at one time. It just doesn't work, you know? You can't change your diet totally overnight. But we can make little changes, bit by bit. And every little one that we do makes a difference. We're not going to become marathon runners overnight, but we can increase our activity a little bit, bit by bit. 
And uh, we can have little habits of how to do it. And um, sometimes people come to me and they want a handicap parking sticker for their car. And I say to them, I don't think you need a handicap parking sticker. I think you need a sticker in your car that says you need to take the farthest parking spot away from the door to get there. Because if you were just about to exercise a little bit more, you'd do better. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, park a little distance away and go for a walk. Uh, and uh, remember that there's no such thing as too inclement of weather here in Canada. There's only improper clothing. So no matter what the weather is, it's never too bad to get out and enjoy the outdoors. Just dress differently and get out there, okay? So a wonderful evening. May you be healthy, happy, and holy, filled with God's Spirit, and we'll see you on Thursday evening, okay?